this Reformation Sunday as we celebrate this, the, the reforming of God's church over 500 years ago. And in that time during the Reformation, the Reformers held to five solas. Sola fide, faith alone. Sola gratia, by grace alone. Sola scriptura, by scripture alone. Solus Christus, by Christ alone. And finally, sola dea gloria, to the glory of God alone. Amen? Amen. And upon these five things, the Reformation moved forward. And we see so many different branches, Baptists, Lutherans, Presbyterians. Here we are to celebrate this Reformation and by God's word be strengthened in the truth of following the Lord Jesus Christ and him alone for our salvation. Amen? Amen. Amen. Welcome. If you're here for the first time, we welcome you. We're so glad to have you here this morning. We pray that you would feel the fellowship and warmth of this church because we are here to glorify God and enjoy Him forever by loving one another, by loving Him, and by loving our neighbors. And so during this time, let's be equipped to go out and to love our neighbors, but first, Let's love each other and let's love him, all right? In this time, I wanted to just point out that we have some announcements in the back of your bulletins. If you look, you'll see some of the things that are happening this next week and into the month. And I was told to let the Ageless Wonders know, the seniors' luncheon, that there will not be a luncheon this uh, this next month, November, okay? So there won't be a luncheon this November. But... Thanksgiving, there is a very special event going on. There is a Thanksgiving dinner for anybody who would like to come and be part of that. If you'd like more information, you can talk to Jim Lee. Jim, would you raise your hand, brother? Jim would love to talk to you and find out uh, how many scoops of potatoes you want on your, on your plate. All right, but that is an opportunity for anybody who would like to come and participate and be part of this Thanksgiving meal together. It'll be right here um, at the church on Thanksgiving evening. Uh, more information about that will be coming. Military Food Drive, we are still collecting up funds for the Military Avenue Church uh, for their food drive to feed 100 people to be able to have enough meals for them. Uh, you can please uh, see that out in the narthex, more information. Our goal is $3,000, and I think we were about at 1200 or so, you said? Yeah. About 1200 so we're on our way, brothers and sisters, to be able to fulfill that 100 meals for those at Military Avenue. Are you guys ready to worship the Lord? Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. Five hundred years the Lord has been working in the midst of many bodies to grow us in truth and how many martyrs had died to proclaim that truth. Today we're going to learn of one of them. And in so doing, may we be strengthened in the fact that we have Bibles in English for us to read. Are you guys ready to worship the Lord? Yes. Okay, that was a little bit better. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you in awe and wonder of the work that you have done throughout the ages, not just these 500 years, Lord, but throughout all of your church of all time, going back even to the believers that waited for Christ Jesus to come, those who were already hoping for the promise of him, the Messiah. And Lord, you brought him at just the right time he came and he died for our sins. And not only did he die, but he rose again from the dead and is alive now forevermore. And because he lives, we know it is true that he took our sins and he bore them and they are dead. And that we are given new life by hope and faith in Christ through his grace alone. Thank you for your grace, Lord, that abounds to us this grace that we celebrate this very day, the joy that we have in you. Lord, bless us in every song that we sing. May we lift up our hearts to praise you this morning. 
In every scripture that we read, Lord, may we savor the truth of what we hear and what we read. And Lord, may we be changed and transformed and inspired by the men and women that you called forth to step up for scripture and to proclaim the truth of Christ Jesus. We thank you for this, and we ask, Lord, that you bless us today as we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Good okay. I have several brothers, and my oldest, when he became a Christian at 75, he said, Ronnie, we're brothers twice over, one in the flesh and one in the spirit. We'll sure not forget the Ziegler family as they mourn the death of uh, their, their dad and, and uh, husband and grandfather. And uh, the text this morning go along with knowing that Dick Ziegler is praising the Lord well beyond our imagination. So let's join him together and sing, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Stand together as we sing. Number 118 in the hymnal, the red hymnal.
Amen. Be seated, please. Good morning. Our invocation uh, scripture reading this morning is from Psalms 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice and the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolation on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. What God ordains is always good. This truth remains unshaken. Though sour, no sorrow needs or death be mine, I shall not be forsaken. I fear no harm, for with his arm he shall embrace and shield me. So to my God I yield me. I turned too many pages. <laughs> Praise the Lord anyway. <laughs> we'll finish the right scripture here. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Amen and amen. You know, I could, at the uh, funeral Friday, uh, Pastor Jason mentioned Lazarus and uh, what Jesus did at, at that time, and I, it was just, it was very moving. And I thought about that, that, you know, when Jesus came up to Lazarus' grave, he asked someone to move the stone. He didn't need to do that. Jesus is all powerful. But he asked someone, he wanted them to be a part of what he was doing. He could have pointed to the stone and it probably would have turned to powder. And also when Lazarus, when he called him forth, he asked someone to remove the grave cloths. Again, he could have pointed at Lazarus and they probably would have dropped to the ground. Isn't it great that on an invocation, we are inviting the Holy Spirit into this place. But he wants us here. Isn't it great to be wanted? He wants us to be a part of what he is doing. And so you're privileged this morning to be here and to be a part of this service. And we thank the Lord for that. Let's pray. Lord, we, we thank you for uh, who you are. We thank you for forgiving us. Uh, for reading the, the wrong line. Uh, we just thank you for your sovereignty, your kingship, for wanting us to be here. You don't need, but you want, and we thank you for that. We thank you for being a part of this service, and we pray that what we do would honor and glorify who you are. We pray all of this, Lord, in your very beautiful name. Amen. Mr. Wing, it was appropriate that you read the first, fifth verse of what God does 
always ordains is always good. It fit right into the scripture. It reminds us of what we're celebrating today, not only the uh, Reformation, but our longing to be with the Lord. Now I have a confession to make myself. Mrs. Laro, it was not your fault that I gave you the wrong text for the next song. I discovered it last night. I'm always right, you know, <laughs> except for, this was the first time I've ever been wrong. <laughs> and don't believe it. So if you're looking in the bulletin, you won't catch on. So if you can see the screen, echo what the Jubilee singers sing today. And then there's a chorus together. So stand together because we believe in God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Stand together.
every promise. I find it very interesting that uh, we, for the first time in quite a while, we sang this song, What God Ordains is Always Good. And Mary, Dick Ziegler's wife, wanted this sung at the funeral. No one knew it, most of us, but guess what? After five verses, you can't miss. So be seated until the fifth verse. And let us remind ourselves 
What God ordains is always good. And pay attention to the text. Hello. I uh, remind you, those of you who have joined our Pray For Me campaign as prayer warriors, prayer champions, can keep up the good work. So important. Even if you forget every once in a while, or maybe you've forgotten for a little while, a long while, but it's never not, it, don't use that as just, oh, well, forget it. I, I messed up. I can't do it anymore. Just pick up where you left off. Keep going with it. It's really important. All right. Well, I was going to give my little speech about shrinking in, but I don't think we're going to be able to shrink in today. Oh, it's good to see you all. So, as Pastor Jason said, if you were listening, this is called Reformation Sunday. And that's because on this, well, October 31st, which happens to also be Halloween, but you know, 
Reformation Day is probably a lot more important. Uh, on Reformation Day in, eight, in 1517, a man named Martin Luther began to preach about what it means to become a Christian. And he tried to clarify what it means to become a Christian. And I want to just talk just a little bit more about that because it's so important for us to understand that what, what was going on in the church 500 years ago and still in many churches today is people were saying that if you want to go to heaven, you have to be a good person. You have to do enough good things. And if you've done some bad things, well, you just need to do more good things. And if you do enough good things, that will outweigh the bad things, and then you'll go to heaven when you die. But you know what? It doesn't work that way. Because we can never do enough good things. Even if we try really, really hard to keep doing good things, it will never be enough because there's only one way. And this is what Martin Luther said. This is what we talk about in our church. There's only one way to become a Christian, and that is we have to have faith in Jesus. We have to believe in Jesus. We have to trust in him that he did the good things for us. Now, we talk about that. I've talked about it a lot over these last few weeks up here in our little gospel train story. But today I want to talk about it in a little different way. And I want to talk about what it means to have faith, what it means to trust. Now, I've done this before, and some of you will remember, some of you won't. But it's, I think it bears repeating. It's kind of fun, too. But we need to remember what it means to have faith. What does it mean? It means to trust in God. But what does that even mean, to trust, to have faith? All right, so who trusts me? Be careful before you raise your hand. You, you trust me? Okay, come here. You want to stand up? I'm going to let her I'll do it. All right, unfortunately, you have to take your glasses off. Can you do that? And Mr. Davis will hold. Okay. We'll just put those right there, okay? Now, you're going to trust me, and so I'm going to blindfold you. How about that? Whoops. Long way. Much better. All right, can you see anything? All I see is black. Oh, all you see is the darkness. Okay. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show us all what it means for Ella to trust me, all right? And that she, she can't see anything. It's dark in, her, in, uh, in front of her eyes right now. So if I told her to go run around the auditorium right now with a blindfold on, what do you think would happen? I'll get injured. You would get injured. That's right. You'd get hurt. Because she couldn't do that. But what if, what if I said, we're going to walk around, but I'm going to guide you. And I will make sure that you don't bump into anything. Now, do you think that would work? Yeah. All right, let's try it. All right, you, you, I'm going to guide you, okay? Move, yep. Okay, now we're going to take a step down. All right. I hope I'm not going to step on a kid. I know it. <laughs> Another step. There you go. All right. All right. Do you see how good Ella's doing? All right. Now, why is she doing so good? Why is she doing so well? Well, I'm helping her, and there's something else. That's You're, She's trusting you. That's right. She's trusting me. Thank you for trusting me. Let's give Ella a hand here. All right. Now, you know what? Okay, you can sit down. It's so simple, right? But so hard. It's so, it looks so easy for her just to follow me around. Now, we could have done all kinds of goofy things and tested her trust even more, but I have a feeling she probably would have trusted me. But you know what? That's all it means with us and God. It means taking his hand. It means following him. And isn't that what we just sang about, everybody? What God ordains? Sorry if I'm getting a little passionate here, but this is where it's at, guys. This is right where it's at, is it, whatever it is that your, dark, your darkness is right now, and a lot of you are facing it. 
There are things we don't know. We don't understand. Faith means that we just put our hands in Jesus' hands and say, okay, I trust you. Take me where you want to go. That's what happens when we become a Christian. Is we say, Jesus, forgive me for my sins. I trust you to be my Lord and Savior. All right, let's stand together. I'm going to pray with you. Lord, I pray that the simplicity of this message, this little lesson, will be something that none of us, from the oldest to the youngest, will, will ever forget. That I won't forget it. I'm going to need to trust you today. I'm going to need to trust you this week. We all need to trust you. And most of all, we need to trust you to forgive us for our sins because there are so many. To trust you to take us to heaven when we die because without you, we can do nothing. So I just commit these kids to you. As we prayed many times over these weeks, I pray that you would do this miraculous work of, of creating faith in their hearts that only you can do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's continue to pray. Let's pray together. Lord, what a glorious thing it is to see these children walking before you in faith, that they would be trained up, that they would be encouraged to follow and trust you. And Lord, I'm thinking of these little ones, but I'm also thinking of the ones who are sitting in these pews. Lord, teach us to follow you. Encourage us to put our trust in you, in your character, in your person, as we read who you are according to your word, O oh God, that you are good. And that means that you are always good. That you are omnipotent. That means you are always omnipotent. There is nothing outside your hands. There is nothing outside your wisdom. There is nothing outside your power. Everything is possible with you, and you have ordained the beginning and the end, and so all will take place just as you have decreed. And Lord, that gives us comfort because you are always good. Always. Lord, we praise you for this truth. We thank you this morning that we worship a, a wonderful and loving God who though he brings justice and rightly so against sin and is even ordained that there shall be a place in which eternally sin shall be dealt with and those who are sinners shall be dealt with, O oh God. Your justice demands it. Your righteousness can have nothing to do with sin. So we are convicted in our hearts, Lord, for none of us are without sin. All of us have dirty hands. All of us have dirty souls. All of us are struggling, oh God. We can never do it right, just as Pastor Jim said. We can never be as righteous as you. And that is the only righteousness that can be in your presence. But what have you done? What have you done? You, O oh Lord, came down. You, O oh Lord, made yourself man. You became one of us. You took on the burdens of being obedient, of fulfilling the law, of answering to the Father, yes, Father, instead of no. And you followed him obediently even to the grave. And upon the cross, O oh Lord, all of our sins, of all generations, of all who would believe and trust in your work were put upon Christ and put to death. Jesus asked, do you believe? Father, right now we cry out in our hearts, we believe. We believe in what your son has done. We believe in what you have done. 
We believe that he rose again on the third day and he is now ascended on high and he sits at the right hand of the majesty. And there is no other name under heaven or earth or under the earth but at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord because you are good. You are always good. And Lord, we want to praise you for the goodness of this day, the celebration of the Reformation. We want to thank you for the faithfulness and the heritage that we we have enjoyed and not even realizing it, the lives that have been laid down, the people that have stepped forward to stand on the truth of God's Word over councils and popes that they would stand and say, no, this is the truth. It cannot be changed. It cannot be trumped. It cannot be overturned. It is solid and never changing. For He is never changing. And He is always good. Lord, bless us today as we worship You. Bless soon the proclamation and and the instruction of some of this heritage that we have enjoyed. Lord, bless us as we give our tithes and our offerings into the basket in the back that, that you would receive it for the purposes of your ministry within this church. Lord, ministries that go out even to the community around us, like the Bella Women's Center, formerly the Pregnancy Resource Center. Still serving you in that capacity, Lord. Still proclaiming your truth as they love those women who come in and love those men who need to learn more about what it means to be a father. And to the women giving free ultrasounds now, Lord, praise you for that. We've been praying for so many years. And now that's a reality. Thank you, Lord, that we can partner with them. Thank you, Lord, that we can minister with them and and we lift up to you their new director megan we pray that you would bless her and help her in all that she's doing lord brand new to this chair and and doing such important things give her all the grace that is necessary to see this vital and important ministry utilized by the communities around It's at the tip of the spear when it comes to fighting against abortion lord and being able to bring forth the reality that a child is life. Lord Jesus, use them in mighty ways and thank you for using what we give to them to be able to bless them. We lift them up and we pray for them this very day. Be with us now, Lord, as we continue to worship and we prepare our hearts for a time in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Glenda will uh, play through the Reformation hymn, uh, pick up the tune as we go, and singing the text.
seated, please. The Word of God this morning. For all scripture is <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> For all scripture is given by inspiration of God and profitable to teach, to improve, to amend, to instruct in righteousness that ye, man of God, be made perfect and prepared unto well good works. Did thou hear? Did thou hear? Did thou hear? Yes. For all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Did thou hear? Yes. How did thou hear? In English? Ah, very interesting. You see, in my day, that was not heard of, that you would hear in the king's language. For in my day, I was put to a stake, tied and bound, a rope put around my neck with a chain. The executioner standing behind me, squeezing as I lost every breath. Before they said, you have one last request, anything to proclaim. And I said, now wait, I am kind of starting at the end, am I not? I should rather back up and give you an understanding of how I am here with a noose around my neck, an executioner about to pull me down. And around me are all of the wood piles in which they have already placed gunpowder, ready to ignite my body in flames. Well, it all began as I entered in to Oxford. I was but 14 years old entering into the college. How many of you were 14 when you entered college? By 17, I had my bachelor's degree, and I had found that God had given me a gift. You see, I come from a, a well-to-do well estate in, in, in Gloucestershire. That is on the western side of England, near Wales. Don't hold that against us. <laughs> it was there that I studied, and I learned that I had a gift for language. French, bonjour. Spanish, hola. Italian, ciao, pasta, la, la, la. <laughs> Greek and Hebrew. German. All of these I learned quite fluently. They came to me like rain. I could understand, and, 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 and I wanted to learn more. And as I began, then at 17, my master's degree, learning these language in such fluency, that also in that time did in England a new king has come. This king, his name is Henry, Henry VIII, and he will be a king like no other king. You've never seen such a strapping man, such a servant of God in so many ways. He has Catherine de Aragon as his bride. She is a queen of such renown and a godly Catholic man. 
It was during this time as I entered in to my master's degree and I studied and learned these languages so that I could know the very language of God that Erasmus, Erasmus, this beautiful scholar, wrote in Greek the Old Testament and the New. And for the first time, scholars such as I could read in the original language the Greek and the Hebrew, which I studied, I could learn as well, and I could read, and I could see the Scriptures themselves. You see, every Bible that had been printed since Gutenberg had been the Latin. And so what, what plowboy understands the Latin text? What milkmaid understands the Latin text? But it is the priest and the priest alone who understands the mysteries of the Scripture and expounds it to the people. As I read in the original Greek, not the Latin, a translation from the Greek, I, I read and I saw that such words were being used and, and changed in some ways. The word ecclesia, which is often translated church within the Latin. This word means the gathering of the people. The gathering of the people. We are Christ's ecclesia. We are his gathering together. Bringing a new understanding into all of those who would be coming and be part of it. We are together, the church. And the word presbytos, this word that is often translated bishop or priest, it means an elder. It means one within the congregation. It means that there is, there is a working of the lay people within the church with power and authority. But that was not the structure in this day of the Roman Catholic Church here in England and with our new king. And so as I studied, uh, something began to rise up in my heart. And I went on from my studies at 19 years old with my master's degree. I left to go to Cambridge to study for my doctorate. And at, Cam and at Cambridge, I learned that there was an inn and this inn I went to is called the White Horse. Perhaps you've been to it. They called it Little Germany because all those who were walking to it, they would say, oh, look, there goes the Germans. They go off to Germany to go speak to each other. Why so? Well, only a few years before, a young monk living in Wittenberg wrote 95 questions that he had for the church about indulgences, about those who would pay a fee and get a sin forgiven, being able to remove grandmama from purgatory by simply placing coins in the priest's hand. He had many issues against this, and, and also for those who would venerate such things as relics and say that that has the power to now remove your soul from purgatory if you go and pray and pay. And this friar, this priest of God, had questions, and he put it out in Latin, and somebody took it off and translated it into German, and then printed, and printed, and printed. And those flyers went around, and soon princes, and plowboys, and many were questioning, yes, why? Why is this? How come this does not propone to Scripture itself? Well, this is why, at the White Horse, it was called Little Germany. For we would come together, us English speaking, and we would come together and share the thoughts of Martin Luther, share the things that were happening in Switzerland with, with Zwingli, and how he would, would, uh, would proclaim even God's truth. 
I heard, in fact, that Luther himself was thinking of translating, get this, translating from the Greek and the Hebrew into German, of all things. And upon my heart began a flame that every single English boy and girl would be able to hear the word of God in their own language and rejoice at the truths of God's word. But this was not popular within the church. In fact, there was tales of a, a family in Coventry, six males and a female, that were burned at the stake. For what, do you ask? For high heresy? For things that would go against perhaps the crown or perhaps against Christ himself? No. They were teaching their children the 23rd Psalm in English. They were teaching him, them the Lord's Prayer in English. And for that, they were put to the stake. I realized that this flame that God was giving me in my heart to translate the word into English was going to be one that was going to be needing some appropriate measures. So I thought what I should do first is I should go to the bishop, Bishop Tunstall. I would go to him and I would request of him formally, Sir Bishop, would you please, please give me the wherewithal, the ability, the, the admonition to go forth and be able to write and translate that everyone would have the Bible in English. He rebuffed me. He rebuffed me not for the sake of what I was saying in English and, and all this, but he did not want to find that Luther's teachings were growing in England. And he wanted to squash them. That was what his focus was upon. And it was not upon me. It was not certainly upon making God's word into English. But does not the word of God say all of Scripture is God breathed all of Scripture. That is the Scripture that is in the Greek. That is the Scripture that is in the Latin. And how not so that it would be the Scripture that is in the English. I was saying with Sir John, Sir John Walsh and Bath, he was nice enough to give me a place to live and be able to have a... a, a, a an occupation of being a chaplain for him and his family and also a tutor for his children. And it was during that time that he would have dinners and he would bring clergy in. And I thought, oh, wonderful, I've studied. Let us speak with these clergy. Let us learn from these priests exactly what they know. And during one of those meals, I heard the most egregious thing I'd ever heard. One of the clergy members said, as he was speaking and, and drinking and we were all eating, he said, we doth not need God's law. We have the popes. <laughs> Forgive me, Sir John, for what I spoke next. Not being able to hold my tongue, I said, I defy the pope and all of his laws. And I would see it if God would give me air enough years. I would see it that every plowboy would know the scriptures better than thou dost. It was not popular, and I was not there long after that moment. Finding as I looked all around London and all around England to try to find somebody who would help me to produce and to publish these, to print them, and not a place in England would do so. This would be their own words, God's lo wonderful law and God's wonderful truth in English, the king's English, and no one wanted it. They stood back from it. So I had to leave England and never return in many ways. I left for Cologne. 
And there I began the work on translating. And within one year, we had the translation finished. Within one year, Will, Roy, my secretary, and I worked together and translated it, and they began to print. But you know what happens when a typesetter goes to the pub and begins drinking a little too much wine? Begin speaking aloud of, oh, you should see what we're doing over there. And before you know it, a staunch Catholic supporter heard this truth, and I had to flee. Only Mark had been printed at that moment. I had to flee very quickly. But as I traveled, I went to all places, worms. Now, you might have heard of this because it is the place where later on Martin Luther would stand in the defense of all that he had been written and be held for heresy. But I found at that moment in Worms a very welcome environment. Printers were welcoming us in, and we began printing 1,000 copies, 2,000 copies, 6,000 copies. And where did they go? Well, to the shores of England, of course. I had made friends with many merchants. Humphrey Momoth was one of my dearest friends and a well-made merchant, and he was able to sail all the way across and bring these there, but a cardinal in Northwich heard of these Bibles and gathered as many as he could together and burned them in a pile. Do you remember Bishop Tunstall, who I spoke to before, and he wanted nothing to do with this? Well, he found out that all of these were coming in, and I will tell you this, he became my number one supporter in this way. He purchased up every single book he could find, every single scripture he could get, so he could burn them. And you know what I did with all the funds he gave me by purchasing all of these books? I made more, quite a few more. His 6,000 turned into many more. We wrote revision after revision, and Tunstall himself took the scriptures and said, look, he has over 2,000 errors in this. I took that to heart. Six revisions later, we had finally what would be printed and used frequently going out to England. But this did not make me popular, except that the king himself from England contacted me, secretly through an agent, finding all of these writings were going about and that I was becoming very popular. The king wanted to speak to me. He said, come, come back to England. And my stipulation was, Lord King, I will come back if you will agree to print the word of God in English. And he declined. This king, as I heard later, was starting to have reform thoughts as well. But his reform thoughts dealt more with his wife and wanting to divorce her and the Pope saying no over and over again. So you know what the king of England did? He made himself the king of the church, removing the pope and setting himself up. Let me tell you, I wrote quite an article about him. The next time he came to talk to me through one of his agents, it was to arrest me and take me back to England. But I had enough friends in Germany that they protected me and guided me as I was working on the Old Testament. I had finished Deuteronomy and was traveling all the way to Hamsburg through, by, by a boat when the ship was wrecked and all of my notes and all of my finished works were lost and I had to start all over again. Authorities were chasing us and many times I would have to eat hand and mouth each and every day. 
We were chased from one city to the next. And finally, I got to Antwerp. And Antwerp was a, a, a lovely place to be able to, to stay and, and, and proclaim and, 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 and work forth on God's word and translation, remembering every single moment. All scripture is God breathed and profitable profitable for the man of God in teaching, instruction, rebuke. But how are they to be rebuked and instructed if they cannot read his very word? And so I finished the Old Testament. Almost. I was so close. But Thomas points home in which I stayed. He invited people in yet again. And a gentleman named Harry Phillips came in. Henry Phillips. Harry by his close friends. <laughs> Henry came in and, and would speak with us at the dining table and was so interested in, in the translations and the things that I was doing that I shared my notes. I shared my papers with him. And one day when the the, the points were, were out of town, and I was there. Henry came to me, and he said, William, William, you have to come with me. You have to come with me now. And I said, what is it, Henry? What, what, what's going on? No, no, no time to speak. You just have to come with me. Very well, I said to my good friend, Henry Phillips. I will go with you. Come, come, down this alleyway. All right, my good friend, Henry Phillips, I will follow you. And there was waiting soldiers. And I was arrested. Fifteen months, I stayed in a Belgian prison. Fifteen months, my family did not know if I was alive or dead. Fifteen months, I had languishing and I don't know if you've been to a Belgian prison. It is disgusting. It is dank, it is dark, it is wet. And all of that time, what did I do? I prayed. Lord God, do one thing. Answer me this one thing. My life is perhaps forfeit, but answer me this one prayer. Pray, please, Lord God. Answer me this one prayer. I was proclaimed a heretic for translating from the original Greek into English that all may know the word. I was condemned by the church to die. So on October, 16, on October 6th, 1536, I stood with my back against a stake. Before the executioner tied the noose and pulled it taut with chain and rope and fire ready to kindle around me, I was asked, what is your one last request? Oh, Lord God, here is my prayer. Lord God, that you would open the eyes of the king of England. And then I was suffocated. And then the pyre was lit around me. Now, witnesses say that I awoke as the flames came up, and that as I awoke, I stared sternly forward, near moving. To be quite honest, I don't remember any of that. <laughs> For I was with the Lord. Two years later, the king of England would authorize the great king's Bible. 83% of it was my work. 76% of the Old Testament and 83% of the new. And later, as King James's Bible was written, the same percentage still stood. My translations still coming through to the word of God, to the people. And as pilgrims sailed for the new world, discovered 
by Christopher Columbus. In that place, they brought with them a Bible containing the words of God in English. This is the heritage that God has given us. For all scripture, all scripture is God breathed and useful for rebuke, for teaching, for training in righteousness that ye, man of God, would be able to do good works. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord God, for men like William Tyndale, who were rebels in their day, but faithful servants to you every day. Lord, thank you that they brought forth the word that we now can read in these faithful translators, these faithful printers, these smuggling merchants brought about such a reformation through the truth of your word which empowered them and emboldened them to the work of your spirit which gave their feet wings. And Lord, all to those who lost their life, for Tyndale lost many friends, many close friends who died in prison or were put to the stake. And yet he pressed on. Lord, let us too press on for your truth. Let us understand the rich blessing we have to have the word in our language to be understood. And thank you, Lord God, for the translators around the world who still to this day translate into unknown languages who have no written print and they're giving them written print, the word of God. Lord, we praise you on this day of Reformation Sunday for what you have done in the world and through the work of these people, but also the truth and the power of your word which can never, ever be held down. Thank you for the blessing of sola scriptura. Thank you, Lord God, that we have your word and it is all we need. In Jesus' name. Amen. The Wicklet Bible translators still, Tom and Judy Coombs, uh, part of this congregation, spent 30 years translating in uh, South America and then other places, and they're with the Lord now. So let's sing again about Christ alone and all the solas of William Tyndale. Stand together as we, we sing.
There is only one place where we can have power, and that is in Christ Jesus. Only one place where we can stand and not fall, and that is in Christ Jesus. And where do we get this truth? Where do we get this understanding? From His Word. And every time we read it, it's new and it's fresh and His Spirit revives us and strengthens us and sets our feet once again upon the rock of Christ. So now receive this benediction on this Reformation Day. To the King glorious, the wonderful God above all gods, to Christ Jesus our Lord who has given us peace through His covenant promises and His fulfillment upon the cross and His ratification out of the grave to Him who is everlasting our Shepherd and our King. To Him be glory and majesty and praise and dominion in the church His people gathered forever. Amen. Amen. God bless you on this Reformation Sunday.